Good evening, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Al Qasmi International Conference uh, Scientific Committee for giving us the uh, chance and the opportunity to be with this, to be with you at this night. We have uh, uh, various, you know, uh, sessions, and the first sessions is allocated for uh, mystery cases in Uviatis. We have eminent and distinguished speaker tonight, and we started with the. Uh, uh, Dr. Ahmed Salam, he's an associated professor, written and UVITIS, director of UVITIS service, uh, Jones I Institute, University of Arkansas, Arkansas for Medical Science, uh, Arkansas, United States. And as well, we have uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Alberto Adenan, if you can see, please, uh, director Institute of Ophthalmology, Hospital Clinic of uh, Barcelona, Spain, for professor, University of uh, Barcelona. And as well, we have Dr. Uh, Armando, he is a director of uh, uh, his uh, uh, associated professor, chair department of ophthalmology and co-director of ophthalmology research, University of uh, Puerto Rico, schools of uh, medicine, University of Puerto Rico, uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, uh, and our, you know, distinguished as well uh, uh, guest speaker is Professor Fishali Gupta. Uh, she is the veterinary and you, yeah. Uh, expert, she is a professor, Department of Ophthalmology, Advanced Eye Centers, Postgraduate Institute of Medicine, Education and Research, Chandigarh, uh, India. And uh, we have uh, uh, Dr. Lilia uh, Cholian. She is a uh, uh, UVIT specialist, Eye Institute at Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi in United Emirates. Uh, she is an assistant professor of ophthalmology at Case Western Reserve University. And uh, we have as well, uh, Dr. Iman Abdel Latif. She is a lecturer of ophthalmology at Alexandria University, Ufiatis consultant uh, from Egypt. And uh, myself, Hassan Al Dibi, senior academic consultant of uh, Fetoretinal Surgeon and uh, Ufiatis at King Khalid, Ispicious, uh, King Khalid Ispicious Hospital in Riyadh. So without any ado, we'd like to start with the first speaker, Dr. Ahmed Salam. He will start his mystery case and will have three minutes for presentation and five minutes for discussion and trying to stick to the time. Dr. Ahmed, mic is yours. Uh, Dr. Adibi, thank you so much. And it's uh, a pleasure re being with you here and with other colleagues. And thank you so much for having me. Uh, I will um, uh, upload my presentation here. Okay, you can go. All right, excellent. Thank you so much. So I have a very interesting case. It's a bit of uh, surgery and a bit of uveitis. So I have this uh, lovely lady who, sorry. Okay, yeah, so I have this 70 year old lovely lady who, Caucasian lady um, who has acute myeloid leukemia and had bone marrow transplant four months prior to presentation. There's also a past history of six months ago, she was treated with intravitreal Ozodex for uh, chronic post-cataract extraction macroedema and her retina settled well and her, her best vision is in the range of 2040. Two weeks um, history now of decreased vision in the left eye as well as pain. Now this is the data here uh, of the right eye which is very good 2020 pseudophagic normal otherwise. Left eye is the problem. Now hand motion, remember her best vision was 2040. Intraocular pressure is low at six. She has inflammation in the front of the eye with three plus pigmented cells as well as KP, uh, sorry, uh, KP three plus pigmented as uh, AC is deep one plus cell and vitreous haze of only one plus. If you take into account the problem of the uh, KPs to the view. And then she has a very subtle retinal detachment, choroidal detachment and a whitish area, which very hard to tell what's that. So that's the view here. Again, uh, all these dotty things uh, are from the KPs on the front. And we, what we can see here is this area, whitish area, which looks more like a, a healed something, or maybe active, maybe healed something. And, um, and that's her OCT with a very shallow retinal detachment and temporal, which is not shown in this picture, uh, in the temporal periphery, she had uh, choroidal detachment as well. So um, that's what I did. I gave her two days 
of prednisone. And then when she came, her inflammation re has settled so nicely that I couldn't see really much inflammation going on, very trace inflammation on the front, but that's now the appearance of the back of the eye. And the question really is, she has a retinal detachment now, but is this an exudative retinal detachment or this is regmatogenous retinal detachment? And how would you tie that with the whitish area there? So when I indented her, my feeling was, this is more of a regmatogenous retinal detachment. The reason was that her inflammation settled, but her uh, retinal detachment is getting worse. Uh, she does have the choroidal detachment, which is also getting worse, but her inflammation settled. And then also there was no shifting of fluid when I uh, did that while I was indenting her. So I took her to the operating room and that's her surgery in very short. The first question is an exclusive. Let me, uh, yeah. So here, so the first question. So I think there are really difficulty putting the, um, I mean, from a surgical point of view, putting trokers in a hypotenuse eye with choroidal detachment. So one tip here surgically, maybe if VR surgeons are following us, young VR surgeon is not to go to the mid vitreous cavity, but to go anteriorly as if you're going into the pars plana. And then definitely do not open that until you check it. But before this, we did an AC tap to take an aqueous sample because we have a retinitis or a possible retinitis in an immunosuppressed host. Uh, I didn't take a vitreous sample because with all what's happening with her vitreous, I did not want to mess up with her vitreous cavity. So we did that. Make sure the impurities inside the eye. Okay. And then here are the other trokers. We got a pupil wide. And now uh, we're looking, re we think, okay, if there's a tear, it would be in this area. And you can see a little bit of Schlieren, but I'll show you the money shot in a second. And now we indented on vitreous removal, uh, which surgery is slightly difficult because of the retinal detachment and the choroidal detachment. But we went all the way through removing the vitreous and trying to look for uh, any breaks. And here is the money shot. You can see the Schlieren, uh, Schlieren coming from the area around the whitish area. You can see the whitish area better, which is really something very slight whitish and an area which is healed. So the appearance really an immunocompromised uh, host would tell you this is maybe a toxplasma retinitis uh, or a viral retinitis. And remember, a viral retinitis and immunocompromised host can behave like a toxoplasma retinitis. And I thought that's a toxoretinitis causing a tear. And then uh, again, from a surgical point, range retinotomy, uh, fluid to fluid, then uh, drain, then under air. And then these are the choroidal detachment. And I thought the break is superiorly. I don't need to drain them. I, all what I need is some gas fill and we should be good. And this is the appearance here. And then laser around the break area and the drainage retinotomy. This is the appearance the first day. I'm sorry, the picture is not very good, but she had about 70% fill. And this is the appearance one week, which is about like 40% gas fill, which enough to cover that area. So moving on to our case really. Uh, so the sample came back positive for CMV retinitis. So we put her on Valgan Cyclovir and that took uh, care of the problem and she remained on steroid drops. I think it's a nice case in my view, it's the difference between exudative and regmatogenous detachment. I think the telling point here uh, is that it doesn't shift and also her inflammation got better, but her detachment got worse. That made, uh, made me think there's an, uh, a regmatogenous uh, detachment here. Uh, from a surgical point, stroke replacement and hypotenuse eye, uh, do you need to drain a choroid or not? And I think the important point is the differential diagnosis of retinitis is very simple. In the absence of a Bechet disease, it's always an infection or a lymphoma. Uh, so an infection, you think bacterial, viral, fungal, protozoal, fungal presents more with like uh, a choroidal disease. So you have toxplasma and viral retinitis on top of the list. And again, the other important to remember retinitis uh, retinitis, differential diagnosis, and immunosuppressed host, and you want to be thinking of infection, particularly toxo and uh, viral uh, CMV retinitis. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. It's a great case. Uh, I think getting a, a decision immediately to get in, it is really, it's a, a critical 
uh, decisions. It's not uneasy for people that might wait, but putting the history of the patient with the, as a immunocompromised patient and the possibility of, you know, necrotizing retinitis and possibility of tear and converting the case from, you know, uh, uh, oxidative to rigmatinous, it is there. Uh, getting in this eye is not uneasy. Uh, I would like to ask you, if allowed to me, uh, is there any result from the tab that you get it? Yes, uh, came back for CMV, positive for CMV retinitis. Okay, that, so that's great. And the other things you yeah, did viral actually, PCR. Yeah, so it's uh, really, I, I, I uh, you know, I congratulate you for getting on time and managing this case. Uh, we have 30 seconds. If anyone having a questions, or we can move to the second speaker. And there is no questions. We can go to the our second uh, case by Dr. Alfredo Adan. Adan, could you, the doctor, um, uh, would like to of share course, the next? Of course, yes, of course. Please uh, not. Uh, uh, Dr. Adan will join us shortly. Please go. And the good uh, things that we have our, you know, uh, uh, counter is there for the time. So it's easy for us to control the time. Uh, Dr. Hassan, you can go to the next speaker. Dr. Adan, he will join little yeah. bit later. Okay. Yeah, uh, the third speaker you mean, okay? Yeah. Is it so that uh, Dr. Armando, are you ready to go? Yes, I'm here, I'm ready to go. You, can, you can you share your, uh, your uh, uh, presentation? See. Share screen. Uh, yes, one second. Okay, can you see it? Yes, it is very clear. Very good. Thank you so much. I am so pleased to be here at this meeting. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation. My case is titled Post-Vaccination Flashes. Uh, there we go. This is the case of a 17-year-old Hispanic woman who complained of photopsias and blurred vision of the left eye of one-week evolution. She had recently received the human papilloma virus vaccine and the meningococcal vaccine together simultaneously 16 days before the onset of her symptoms. The past medical history, social history, and family history, as well as the revealed systems were unremarkable. On exam, her best corrected vision was 2020 in the right eye and 2040 in the left eye. The external exam, as well as the slit lamp examination, was normal. However, in the left fundus, we could see some white dots in the macula that extended to the nasal periphery. It's easier to see the dots here on the red free fundus. The fundus autofluorescence it reveals some hyper autofluorescent dots in the macula as well as in the nasal periphery. We saw some staining in the fluorescein angiogram and some hypocyanescent dots in the late ICG, some of which correlated with the white lesions. This is spectral domain OCT, where we can see some ellipsoid sound changes that corresponded to some of the lesions noted in the macula. We did a workup. The chest x-ray was normal, so it was negative for syphilis. At one month follow of visit, she still had some occasional flashes. At this point, we could see some brown lesions in the nasal retina. However, the fundus of refrescence was back to normal. By the three months time, she was back to baseline. This is the timeline. She received the combined meningococcal and HPV vaccine 16 days before presentation. She started with symptoms of the left eye. Subsequently, so four weeks after, she got a second dose of the human papillomavirus vaccine, which was followed then by the patient developing COVID-19, after which she had then two doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. This was four and five months after. At a month follow-up, she starts with flashes in the other eye. Her vest corrective vision was still 2020. We look at the right eye at the MS follow up visit, we can see that there are some white dots nasal to the disc that correspond with increased hyper autofluorescence, some staining in the fluorescein angiogram, and hypocyanescent dots in the ICG. And interestingly, at nine months, while there were some brown lesions nasal to the disc, she developed some white dots now temporal to the macula with some hyper autofluorescent dots and some hypocyanescent dots on the ICG. 
So what was our assessment? Our assessment was that of mutes. As you know, mutes was a, is a condition uh, described by Professor Lee Jean Paul, 1984, also referred to as a common cold of the retina. It could also be masquerated by things as syphilis and vitreoretinal lymphoma. This is the complete timeline. The patient had the combined meningococcal HPV vaccination 16 days before presentation. She develops mutes in the left eye. Then she has the second HPV vaccine. She gets COVID-19. Two doses of the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine, and then she begins with mute in the right eye, which interestingly was followed by an intraocular same eye recurrence of mutes. Subsequently, she had a third dose of COVID-19 vaccine, and she's doing fine now. A way we can look at all this white dot syndrome is to refer to them as a primary inflammatory clear capillaropathy, which is a term used to describe them based on a common um, etiology of inflammation of the Courier capillaries. And uh, this is a table that shows some of the PICCPs uh, previously uh, attributed to vaccinations out there in the literature. You can see there are many cases of AMPI, mutes, and multifocal choroiditis attributed to post vaccination etiology. Our case would actually be the second case in the literature occurring after combined HPV and meningococcal vaccine. I'd also like to point out a recent case published in Ocular Immunology and Inflammation uh, out of China, in which a patient that originally had mutes in 2012 uh, received the Sinovac COVID-19 vaccine, which is the Sinus vaccine, and two days later developed a recurrent episode of mutes. So to conclude, one, one of the main take-home points is that PICCP, such as IAPSA, MP, and mutes can oftentimes occur after vaccinations. And what this is telling us is assuring the post-infectious or perhaps immune mimicry etiology of some of these conditions. This is actually the second case of that or of mutes that would be reported in the medical literature following HPV and meningococcal vaccines. And still we have to uh, further study the potential role of COVID-19 vaccines as potentiating recurrent mutes. So thank you so much. Open to questions. While we are waiting for thank Dr. Levy. Yeah. Hey, th th thank you. Thank you. I, I was muting them at that. Thank you, okay. Dr. Uh, thank you, Dr. Armando. It's a great case. And uh, I'm sure that uh, most of us uh, uh, have encountered cases with vaccines like that. And uh, in, in radio five dot syndromes, uh, well, Ma, uh, the question here is, is what is the pathogenesis? Is it an autoimmune you know, white dot syndromes or just only uh, patients having uh, some sort of viral associated at that times, low grades, you know, uh, really it is, uh, 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 as you know, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the mu mute is, is, is you know, uh, should be idiopathic uh, uh, and, uh, and diagnosis of explosions. I would like to open this is for questions, but it is a great case. We have uh, Thank you so much. 30 seconds. You know, I think it could be because we all do understand that many of these vaccinations are inducing a lot of autoimmune and now even autoinflammatory responses in the eye. And we have two cases of mutes occurring after COVID vaccination. And when Carlos Pavesio was collecting cases post vaccination, there are quite a few number. So and we had COVID shield, which is not even an RNA vaccine. So I think there is something which we all do not understand, but it's definitely some thing is happening. We, yeah. you know, we are seeing these unusual patients. Yeah, yeah. I put it as an autoimmune uh, white dot syndrome. Yeah. Right. Because mm -hmm. it's not sometimes fit to any types, you know, mute it's okay as a, uh, you know, reported, but there is some cases sometimes coming like, you know, uh, uh, MB. Some of them coming as, you know, surveillance like. Well, I show you one case that might be helping that. Uh, 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 Nick's speaker is uh, Dr. Alfredo. He is with us now. If you could share your, um, you know, presentation and thank you, Armando, for your great case. You're very welcome. Thank you, Doc. Okay. Did you see my, my screen? Yeah. Yes, yes. It's go ahead, please. Okay, thank you for the invitation for participating in this, in this interesting meeting. Uh, my case is a 32 years old man. Uh, this patient has 
sudden visual loss in, in his right eye. His solar acuity in right eye was 2018, no cells in anterior chamber. The patient was controlled in other center and was treated with a prednisone, oral prednisone. And after six months, this is the, the aspect of the fundus of the eye with, with vitreous cells. So the patient was, was treated with a diagnostic vitrectomy in other, in other center. So the systemic workup was completely normal. The brain uh, uh, magnetic resonance was also normal. Uh, the diagnostic vitrectomy shows uh, inflammatory cells in the vitreous. I controlled for first time the patient in September 2020. The visual acuity in this right eye, in this right eye was uh, 2080, the left eye was completely normal and was uh, surprising for me the, the pattern of the autofluorescence in this right, right eye. This is a, a aspect of leopard spot chorioretinopathy. This type of pattern has, has been described in, in different diseases. The patient has no medical history or if any, any other, any other uh, pathology. And this is the list of the possibility, uh, the differential diagnosis of the of the disease. This is the OCT. The OCT was this hyperreflective material um, in the upper part of the Brooks membrane. The choroidal vessel was dilated. And this is the OCT angiography. OCT and FAS was these dark areas in the choriocapillaries and, and, the, and the choroid also. The patient after, after this, in this, this moment, uh, we don't treat this patient because we don't know the diagnosis. And in our opinion, the, the eye was not with active inflammation, but the patient has complaining, uh, complaining in the left eye of the patient, uh, uh, photopsia and barred vision in the left eye. The visual acuity was 20-30, no cells. Uh, and the, in the ophthalmoscopy was this type of uh, multifocal choroiditis uh, in, in left eye. So with a... Uh, with vitreous cells also in the in the uh, in, in this moment of examination, the the macula has this aspect of the macula with the with this typical uh, area of deep reflective material similar to the right eye, uh, the the choroidal vessels was dilated, so we we thought that the patient has an inflammatory disease, but we don't know exactly which inflammatory disease. We treat the patient with the intravenous methylprednisolone and also we inject an ophthalmic in the left eye. This is the, uh, the, the white field uh, angiography. We see this, this type of pattern also in the, in, the in the right eye. In the left eye was this hypofluorescence lesion and hyperfluorescence lesion in the macula. The, Pattern of the right eye was this type of uh, leopard uh, spots in the in in all the posterior pole, and in the in the left eye was different the, the pattern of the of the autofluorescence. So the patient in May 20, uh, 2021, um, uh, the patient refers a decrease of visual acuity and scotoma paracentral scotoma in the left eye. You see this type of hyperreflective lesion paracentral of the, of, the, of the fovea. Visual acuity was 2060. Uh, we, we were without diagnosis of this, this patient. And the pattern of the autofluorescence in the left eye was similar to the right eye. So it uh, was a very difficult case for us because it was a young, a young patient with this type of disease. This is the uh, OCT. Uh, Right eye and left eye was was uh, similar in terms of hyperreflective material, but the patient in November 2021 in the right eye has this type of surretinal aspect of white surretinal necrosis area uh, with this both uh, both areas. So um, we uh, we we perform PCR in anterior chamber was negative for for virus. So we decided to perform an endoretinal biopsy in the, in the temporal area. This is the, the photograph uh, 24 after the, the surgery. We, we perform a, a, a retinectomy, a, a retinectomy, and also we inject silicone oil in the, in the eye. 
And for what was very surprising because the diagnosis of the patient, this is the left eye, the diagnosis was, was a, a pitoretinal B lymphoma. So um, this is a young patient without systemic, uh, without brain disease. So uh, the, the, the B cells was, was typical and also the uh, genetic diagnosis also was typical with lymphoma. This is the aspect uh, six months after, uh, after the, the surgery, we removed the siliconoid yesterday. The patient is under the treatment, the treatment with, uh, with this type of uh, induction treatment with uh, chemotherapy and consolidation, consolidation treatment with, um, with a, a transplant of hematologic cells. It, this is a complicated case for us and we can discuss. And thank you very much for the attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Alfredo. It's a great unexpected case as masquerade usually. Uh, really, I, I put that in my mind, but going with the, you know, the age of the patients, you know, it's uh, 32 year old. So uh, uh, putting as primary ocular lymphoma, it is really, it's not coming in the mind immediately, but really we open it for, uh, you know, uh, discussions. Can I make a comment, please? Go yes. ahead, doctor. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think the initial presentation where Dr. Atnan beautifully showed that leopard skin appearance and the OCT showed lumpy, bumpy deposits in the subretinal material. I think that was the giveaway sign. So when in doubt, it's always a good idea to do vitreous biopsy and look for IL-610 ratio because that is something which we can very easily do. And if IL-10 is elevated, that's a straightaway marker for lymphoma, besides mid-88 and other PCRs and cytology, of course. But uh, uh, with these investigations, we rarely ever need to do retinal biopsy, which is a big procedure. Yes, I, I think one of the problems with you have to discuss the cases with the hematologists, they need uh, the, the cytology. They need the cytology to treat the patient. Because uh, this, is, this is a big problem because if, uh, if there are no uh, lymphoma cells in the vitreous and the, and the cells are in, just in the, in the subretinal space, yes. so it is very difficult to have because the patient has a vitrectomy, previously a vitrectomy, but the problem is to perform in this case a, 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 vitreo, a retinal biopsy because it's uh, very- Alfredo, I have performed all these, but if you will see the retinal tissue per se is unaffected by lymphoma, it yeah. is the subretinal. So I yeah. have even done OCT guided, gone into the subretinal space with the needle and aspirated with the fluid needle, that also gives the result. Uh, but fortunately for us, our uh, you know, team does not, oncology team gives treatment as per the Mayo Clinic protocol, and they do not insist on biopsy. Thank you. Yeah, thank I you very much. The, yeah, thank you, Doctor. I think the key point in the biopsy itself, you know, uh, realizing you know, the OCT, how they change this, but usually it's not, immediately coming on, on your mind. So starting with the treatment and, but when they're getting the patient uh, situation is getting worse, I think this is the time where you get in and get, you know, more, uh, you know, uh, invasive procedure. It's a really great case and expected, but this is usually the, the masquerades. Thank you doc for this great case. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. If, you do, if you'd like to allow me to present my case and to share it with you guys, So my case is 35 year old, a female presented with history of sudden decreased vision, both eyes, right eye more than the left eye, six weeks duration. She was referred on uh, Bridgeford Q4 hourly cyclogel as well oral prednisone 20 milligram. And her past medical history and review systems were negative except for a numbness and weakness, history of on and off headache and skin closing. Uh, her examination showed that visual lack in both eyes 2125 and the pressure was with a normal. Uh, her um, anterior segment examination showed that the cornea clear, no KBs, the anterior chamber 
uh, were deep with one blood cells in both eyes, mostly pigmented. The iris shows some sort of small signaking and no iris nodules. Her dilated fundus exam showed these pictures. For more magnifications, if you look, there is multiple, you know, uh, foci of um, uh, creamy yellowish uh, lesions that uh, involving uh, scrambling over the macula and extending to the periphery uh, in the right eye. Uh, most of the lesion getting together at the macula, the disc and blood vessels uh, uh, seems normal at this point. Her left eye showed this multifocals area of, uh, you know, deep uh, uh, creamy white lesions, same as the uh, peripheral eye. So we started our initial, you know, uh, uh, you know, imaging, and we started with the enhanced depth uh, uh, OCT. And if you look in the right eye, the upper one, we showed that there is, you know, subretinal fluid with the uh, uh, shallow retinal detachment in both eyes. And if you look for the outer retina, you know, there is a lot of disorganizations, and there is uh, 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 as well, you know, a regularity of um, uh, ellipsoids in with thinning as well in the same times in both eyes. Uh, right eye more than the left eye. As well, there is a thickening of the choroid in uh, uh, both eyes. There is some few vitreous cells, if you see it just only, uh, uh, just a few, not that too much, with minimal uh, swelling of the disc beside the lesions. Uh, you know, the outer retina, uh, ellipsoids in photoreceptors, and as well, the uh, pigmented epithelium were uh, uh, involved. In addition, there is, you know, the hyperpigmented dots that in the retina itself and then reflected as well in the in the in the choroid. Here, when you're looking for the there is splitting of outer retina. So uh, uh, this is the finding at that time. Hair fluorescent angiogram, uh, starting with hypofluorescent and with the time starting to have staining and minimal leakage from the from the lesions with. Uh, 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 hyperfluorescent of the disc itself. Same thing as in the left eye with uh, intense hyperfluorescent of the lesion at the late phase. So uh, the patient were subjected to uh, investigations. Uh, here in such areas as uh, such case, we do the uh, basic workups, including the complete blood count, liver function test, renal function test, were turned to be normal. And then we did syphilis, TB, and sarcoidosis workup where turn it as well negative. We have some comments about, you know, BVD test as the patient already uh, started on systemic steroids. So we enhance that with quantiferon and here uh, CT scan schist was even though within normal. <clears throat> so after a couple of weeks, she came and her lesion starting to be consolidated, but not to the extent that we uh, are looking for, but still there is some activity there. So the steroid were increased in the same times and putting in our mind that the tuberculosis is, could be masquerade, big masquerade. So we started here empirically in the anti-TB uh, uh, you know, course as well. Uh, and lately we started as well in immunosuppressive uh, medication in form of salsep. This is her you know, uh, pictures after starting the medications, the lesion is not increasing, but not regressing in the same time. Here, autofluorescent showing that some areas of high, uh, hyper and alternate with a hyper, uh, hyper uh, autofluorescent. Here, fluorescent angiography now starting to have more staining rather than to be having hypo and late hyper. And starting to have a scarring in her right eye, as will you see that subretinal fibrosis starting in her right eye. Left eye almost having the same, with the same behavior in uh, uh, clinical picture as well in the fluorescent and geography. OCT show that subsided the subretinal fluid and starting to have some sort of fibrous perforations underneath the retina at the area of, you know, this big lesions with thinning and atrophy of ellipsoid zone and retinal pigmented epithelium. The choroidal, you know, thickness starting to be uh, uh, regressed and decreased in size. And this is his latest latest photos. As you see that there is subretinal fibrosis uh, all over <clears throat> in both eyes. So uh, 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 differential diagnosis of such case as a case of multifocal choroiditis, we have to rule out the infectious like, you know, tuberculosis, syphilis, and, you know, non-infectious like, uh, 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 like uh, 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 sarcoidosis. 
And, uh, you know, uh, uh, lately when we are digging in the case, we find that it might resembling this lacoid chorotinitis, which is, you know, varieties of MB uh, uh, serpiginous uh, uh, cases. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, but the difference in the nature is mostly regarding the course of the disease. So uh, I share this case for you. If you have any questions, any, you know, comments and, uh, you know, guidelines will be good. The patient now finished her course of uh, TB and just kept in uh, uh, immunosuppressive medication with five milligram of prednisone and seltzer and the fusion in form of 2200 in both eyes. Thank you for attention. Dr. Fital, you are the, uh, you know, the experts of multifocal. Dr. Devi, we all have these cases where we try everything and they keep on progressing relentlessly. Uh, I have personally found Ozodex to be helping them. Maybe it keeps a very high concentration of steroids in the cavity along with the immunosuppression, but you've done a great job. So. Uh, really it is now the patient developing cataract and we're operating in her, she is young lady. Um, and we know from the beginning, the course is not will be you know, easy. Young patients especially have this course. Yeah, this is it's some sort of, I think, an autoimmune, you know, which yeah. is usually you cannot control it. Absolutely. But well, regarding to anti-TB, are you giving such cases, doctor, doctor from the beginning? Yes. Because, you know, uh, Dr. DB, we try everything in these patients. You know, you try so desperately. I have few patients, you give anti-TB. Some patients I have even tried antiviral immunosuppression, you know, everything. But only thing that, only thing that- I, I, get, dep I get depressed, really, yeah. You know, and now I'm facing another one. I presented for as a multimodal, having all the thing, OCT and you and everything, uh, OCT, I, I really am. Thank you, know, you, I don't like to, yes, go ahead, please. And one fine day, it just stops progressing, but that is when everything is involved. Then it yeah. dies down. Yeah, that's time, the time, the time. Thank you, doctor. Uh, 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 if you don't mind, we can go for the next speaker, Dr. Uh, Lillian. Julian, my friend, can you share your uh, presentation? Good evening. Uh, yes, I will share my presentation. Great. So thank you so much for this kind invitation. Uh, without further ado, I will start with my mystery case for this first UVIT session. This is a, a young patient. He was, uh, by the time of presentation, 27 years old, otherwise completely healthy. And he came one day to the clinic as a walk-in saying, doctor, I see black dots moving. Mm -hmm. His... Uh, uh, initial uh, visual examination was completely normal, 2020 uh, visual acuity uncorrected, each eye, uh, normal pressure, completely quiet anterior segment, no vitreous cells, and I was prepared to see some vitreous floaters. However, this is how the retinas, they look like. And as you can see here in both eyes, we have these uh, uh, multifocal areas of segmental venous sheathing with some uh, hyperemia of the optic disc in the left eye and no vitreous cells. You can see very clear here uh, the images of the retina. So we proceed with fluorescent angiography and ICG. Here you are the, light, the late frames of both, uh, both studies. And you can see that it is mainly a case of retinal vasculitis. The choroid is not much involved in the ICG frames. So I label the case as a bilateral retinal vasculitis, mainly a phlebitis affecting medium-sized veins. And I run a, some blood test for the patient. The only positive things were sedimentation rate at 45, CRP 10, and quantiferon positive. The rest was completely negative. So I talked to him, I said, listen, maybe this is the case of um, 
tubercular retinal vasculitis. He was shocked because we talk about tuberculosis and he never imagined he could have uh, uh, had such an infectious disease, no history of travels or anything. But I said, don't worry, we can start treatment. And my proposal was to start uh, anti-tuberculostatics. And I told him, you come back after one week or 10 days and we will start um, corticosteroids. He said, yes, no problem, but he disappeared. And around two months later, he came back as a walking and he said, doctor, I have to tell you, I was very nervous. So I decided to travel out of the country, outside the country for a second opinion. And I went to Europe and I am very happy because they said exactly the same. So I just wanted to share this with you and I will keep coming to see you. And they gave exactly the same treatment. So I said, which is the treatment? And he showed me the anti-tuberculostatic treatment with four drugs. How do you feel? I feel perfect, 2020 visual acuity, uh, no cells in the anterior segment, normal pressure, no vitreous cells. And here you are, the fundus. Again, the right eye, almost nothing. You can enlarge these pictures and see a little bit of vascular sheathing, but the left eye now has multifocal choroidal lesions, and it has also peripheral hemorrhages, and this beautiful image here of a serpiginous choroiditis. So at the beginning, when he started treatment, choroid was clear, only veins involvement. And now after treatment, we have this uh, choroidal involvement mainly in the left eye. Here you have again, fluorescent angiography and ICG. If you see the right eye has more in the fluorescent angiography than you can see in the direct fundus examination and the beautiful picture of serpiginous like tubercular choroiditis in the left eye. So uh, we all know that with the TB, the, uh, we can face a paradoxical worsening of the retinitis following the initiation of antitubercular therapy. Oh, I have, I have a, like a sound from another session. I don't know if you can hear that. They are talking about puntal plugs. So um, again, we know already this, but the, the interesting thing in my patient is that this paradoxical worsening actually changed the clinical picture because we started with tubercular retinal vasculitis and we ended with serpiginous like tubercular choroiditis. So it's not only that the disease uh, was worse, but also was different. Uh, I started him on corticosteroids, uh, 40 milligrams per day, uh, and I taper slowly. Here you can see the initial fundus autofluorescence with this active lesion at the level of the choroid. And after around uh, three to four months, this is the final lesion completely healed, and the patient retained 2020 visual acuity, and the evolution was fantastic. So, this is a very simple case. Uh, Still, there are a lot of mysteries around uh, the management of tubercular uveitis, but I guess as take home messages, we have to keep in mind that the disease we are seeing is actually the interplay between mycobacterium tuberculosis and the host immune response. And in some clinical pictures like retinal vasculitis and serpiginous like tubercular choroiditis, the immune, uh, these are mainly immune mediating manifestations of tubercular uveitis. So for these particular cases, it's very important to keep in mind the role of corticosteroids and immunosuppressants in the management of the disease. I am sure if I could have the, uh, had the opportunity to start him on corticosteroids, this would not have happened. Uh, there are some reports saying that the disease can go 
very well without corticosteroids. And some others, they say the contrary. In 2013, I had the chance to inject intravitreal methotrexate in the management of one of these cases who was actually not responding to corticosteroids. And again, this is, I think, a simple case, but we have a lot of cases of tuberculosis in the area. And this is just to keep in mind the role of, of the immune system in the pathogenesis of the disease. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Um, uh, Karina. It's a great case. Uh, I cannot speak while we have the expert of, you know, yeah. uh, TB vasculitis. <laughs> so let's Michelle. see what she's saying. She will, she will be the speaker and she will give her comments. Thank you very thank much. You so thank much. you for your kind comments and a beautiful case, Dr. Julian. <clears throat> I really do not have to add anything because she's explained everything so beautifully. I totally agree so with you. I was doubt about the possibility of, uh, you know, Baggett's disease, especially in this age, but she confirmed it with, I think, you know, the quantiferon and BBD. So Dr. Dibi, am I next? Yeah, you are the one. Yeah. Perfect. Please, I'm sorry, I passed you for, uh, by mistake. Okay. Yeah, it is there. Again, once again, Dr. Dibi and the team, it's always pleasure coming and seeing all of you, though it's just virtual. So I'm going to present a case of 12-year-old boy who came to us with decreased vision in both eyes since last 10 days. Now he was carrying these images with him, which had these spots and some funny looking lesion at the level of outer retina. The left eye was definitely much more dramatic and you could see these white lesions at the level of the outer retina and something more dense happening close to the macula and the lesions were widespread. To be very honest, I had not seen anything like this and like were wondering what it is. So we got the fluorescein angiography done and very interestingly, it. In the right eye, where there were lesions, it did not show much. But in the left eye, in the center where all those patches was, it just showed kind of diffuse leakage, which again was not very informative. Yeah. Now, within one week of presentation, while we were figuring out, and he was carrying his images, which were taken one week ago, and when he presented to us, the lesion in the right eye had already progressed. So whatever it is, it is progressing within a matter of days. You know, within three, four days, the right eye from here is gone here. And the left eye was bad. So when we did the OCT in the right eye, there is a defect here in the outer retina as if it is being eaten away. The rest of the retina was by and large not really showing much changes except the center. The left eye, which was like this one week ago, had undergone total atrophy and kind of a healing. And OCT again showed the retina which had undergone atrophy with some damage to the neural tissue. So at this point, we suspected SSPE. And uh, when we asked the patient's parents, the parents did complain of poor school performance and history of dementia of recent onset. So we did MRI brain, which showed the there were uh, lesions involving the MRI, hyperintense lesions, and then we also did EEG. EEG is actually very classic in these patients because it shows symmetrics in Kronos, periodic polyphasic high voltage. So this is what it is. And what I want to just bring it up, that patient did have myoclinic scissors, but that was a part of the whole story. So what exactly is subacute sclerosic panencephalitis? It's a progressive neurologic disease caused by measles, and it typically follows 
a preceding measles episode, usually before the age of two year. And by and large in children, uh, it can occur at a mean interval of seven years. More common in boys, and you may have personality and behavior changes followed by dementia. Visual symptoms generally come before neurologic symptom by several weeks. And visual loss is very rapid. The disease comes like a fire. And within one week or 10 days, now we have experience of 10 such patients, you would see that the whole thing just becomes necrotic and the retina gets eaten away. So there may not be any vitreous inflammation. You just see patchy areas of necrosis and viral particles typical of measles virus have been reported. Uh, in this particular patient, we did the CSF and serum both, and we found the antibodies were elevated in CSF. And MRI gives the clue that shows periventricular white matter changes. So it's not every day that we see these patients, but I just wanted to discuss it because I got very perplexed when I first looked at these images. And once I started identifying it, uh, we are seeing, uh, you know, we do have many patients, not many, but we do come across. And especially in some of the communities where vaccine you know, people don't accept vaccine. So you may have once in a while a situation like this. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Afishali. It's a really poor guy. I cannot say anything like that. And any for so cases of, you know, uh, SSPE. Uh, but still, we have to put it in our differential diagnosis and we don't need to forget it. Uh, uh, the questions now, Yani, uh, what will be the options for us? Yani, we're already in a couple of days, you know, the retina is being eaten, you know, and starting to have, you know, all the effects. So is there anything to do in these cases? Interferon. Interferons are being used, but that's more for the neurologic reason. Uh, but still, you know, if we can save lives with timely intervention, but probably for eye, it just you know, kills the central retina and then a counting finger vision remains. There is nothing, no proven treatment or standard of care. I think the home message from this case, we have to put it in our minds all the times. Nothing is rare, cannot be habit. So uh, uh, great case, doctor. Thank you. Thank you for your description of this case. And we have, uh, you know, uh, the, the last but not the last, uh, of our speaker, Dr. Iman uh, uh, Abdel Latif. And um, welcome, Dr. Iman, and good to see you uh, this night and looking for your uh, case uh, for this night. Thank you very much, Professor Didi, and thank you all the, the panelists and attendants. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, and I'll share the, um, uh, the case uh, in a minute. It's always a pleasure to share uh, with your excellency and all the uh, respected panelists and attendees in the uh, Kasimi Congress uh, every year. Uh, the case I'm going to share is a 45-year-old female uh, who was referred with bilateral uh, non granulomatous anterior uveitis that has been recurring uh, every couple of months after withdrawal of her topical uh, steroids uh, for a uh, total duration of about four years. Ophthalmic evaluation upon referral uh, revealed the visual acuity of uh, 624 in the right eye and 618 in the left. The interocular pressure uh, and the fundus were within normal in both eyes. Uh, she had no significant pain or cilia injection. However, she had a dense anterior uh, chamber cellular uh, reaction and a low grade of flare. Uh, for over four years of recurrent attacks, uh, responding uh, to topical steroids for a moment and then recurring back when once the uh, steroids were tapered, she was uh, uh, diagnosed as idiopathic anterior uveitis. Uh, when she was uh, referred to me, I uh, conducted a quick uh, systemic uh, 
evaluation, and I'll share with you uh, the findings. She had uh, significant edema and swelling of her right upper limb. As shown here in the picture, the girth of her right upper limb is about twice that of the left. And for uh, this edema and thickening of the uh, right upper limb, this poor lady had undergone a series of surgical operations. In uh, April 2010, she suffered from numbness in the palm of her right hand, and she was diagnosed as carpal tunnel syndrome, for which uh, she underwent an incision of the flexor retinaculum. Uh, and the upper limb edema as a cause for the carpal tunnel syndrome was overlooked. One year later, she developed pallor of the same hand and she was diagnosed as a different syndrome, as anatomical snuff box syndrome, for which she underwent incision of the tendon of the muscle called the extensor pollicis longus muscle, the muscle that extends the terminal phalanx of the thumb. And again, the uh, uh, edema of the upper limb as a cause of compression of the, retinal, of the radial artery was overlooked and was attributed only to the uh, tendon of the poor extensor pollicis longus muscle. About a year later, she developed the upper limb edema increased greatly and she was diagnosed as a thoracic outlet syndrome. And it, it, this was attributed to uh, maybe an enlarged pectoralis minor muscle. And she did a very um, uh, sky surgery to excise the pectoralis minor muscle uh, that was uh, claimed to be uh, the cause. Uh, after excision of her pectoralis minor uh, muscle, the upper limb edema persisted and even increased and she was still thought to have a thoracic outlet syndrome. And the surgeon, uh, after exercising the pectoralis minor muscle, was preparing her for first rib excision, which he eventually did for the lady. Uh, after exercising her first rib in an attempt to uh, re uh, relieve the um, thoracic outlet syndrome, uh, the upper limb edema increased and she was um, uh, admitted uh, in the hospital and underwent a series of electrophysiologic assessments that excluded uh, the presence of thoracic outlets in room and she was discharged uh, from the uh, university hospital, from the uh, tertiary hospital, with the diagnosis of no thoracic outlet syndrome, but still without a firm diagnosis for the cause of her upper limb edema. Uh, later, after the uh, pectoralis minor excision and first rib excision, she developed severely limited mobility of her right shoulder, and she was diagnosed as iatrogenic shoulder periarthritis, and uh, she was uh, being prepared for shoulder replacement uh, surgery. While awaiting the uh, fulfillment of preparations for the shoulder replacement surgery, uh, she developed uh, disturbed sensorium, and she was admitted in the uh, intensive care unit uh, when the uh, uh, staff found the brain edema and still diagnosed it as of unknown cause. Uh, now, what is the leash? This lady had a venous edema. Uh, the uh, edema of, of her upper limb was uh, pitting, so she had a venous occlusion. And the next question we need to answer is, where is that occlusion? To answer this question, we will have a quick review of the anatomy of uh, some of our uh, big veins of the, of the thorax and neck. When a patient has edema of the whole upper limb, then the occlusion or obstruction is at or proximal to the subclavian vein. When he has edema of the brain, this could be caused by either a local lesion, for example, a, a tumor, or if it is a venous occlusion, then this venous occlusion is at or proximal to the internal jugular vein. This lady had a combined edema of the upper limb and of the ipsilateral side of her brain. So this localizes the lesion to the superior vena cava. Uh, the occlusion of the superior vena cava uh, by this um, way by this pathology is called mediastinal vein syndrome. What is the mediastinal? It is the connective tissue between the heart and the lungs that holds the trachea, the lymph nodes, and the major vessels. Mediastinal vein syndrome is a known presentation of Bechet's disease. Bechet's disease causes inflammation of the connective tissue of the mediastinum, and the swollen inflamed tissues compress the superior vena cava, uh, causing a mass-like effect. I ordered a venogram, which showed extensive compression uh, of the superior uh, vena cava. 
So the uh, etiology for uh, the uveitis, the upper limb edema and the brain edema was Bichette's disease. However, the presentation was a little bit far from the classic presentation. We, uh, we are acquainted with the oral ulcers and genital ulcers. Not, not every single case of Bichette's disease presents with mucocutaneous manifestations. My take home messages is that the, uh, that the body is one unit and uveitis could be part of a systemic disease. Failure to recognize the whole picture could lead to serious morbidity up to uh, death of the patient. And thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Iman. It's a great case. Okay. First time to see such an aggressive, you know, associations of Bahia disease with this some sort of, you know, uh, uh, compression and occlusions of the penis, you know, drainage. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to have, you know, a few seconds because we are out of time. If there is a question for Dr. Iman. Beautiful case. Thank you so much, my. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. It's a great. I would like to thank all of you. And because we are almost now, you know, uh, exceeding our time. Thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Muhammad, for giving us this opportunity to uh, uh, present our mystery cases in Uviatis. Thank you all for this great, interesting, and I would like to see you, inshallah, again and again. We have two more Uviatis session. The next one will be multimodal, uh, you know, imaging in Uviatis. I'm sure that will be, uh, you know, uh, uh, interesting for everyone, so please join us. Uh, and the third one is will be one hour short uh, uh, Uviatis course, like a crash course, that help you how to approach a UVS station. Thank you to be with us tonight and see you inshallah in the next sessions. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you Professor. Thank you.